Om gana timran dasya angana angana sarakaya chaksurun militam yana tajmai Sri Guru Venama Sri Chaitanyamano Vistam Stapitam yana bhutale Swayam rupakaramayam darati swaparantikam Vandeham Sri Guru Siyata Parakamanam Sri Guru Vaishnavam Sya Sri Rupam Sagatatam Sahagana Raganatam Vitam Stam Sadevam Sadvaitam Savadutam Parijana Saitam Krishna Chaitanya Devam Sri Radha Krishna Padan Sahagana Lalita Sri Vishakan Vitam Sya He Krishna Karuna Sindhu Dinu Bandhu Jagatpate Gopisha Gopika Kanta Radha Kanta Namostute Jayatam Surato Pango, Mamma Mandir Matergiti, Matsava Shipadam Boja, Rada and Madana Mohano, Seaman Rasa Rasa Rambi, Bamsi, but the Carson Benes and Opi, Gopanata Sri Saram, Namaum Vishnu, Padaya Krishna Pistaya Bhutade, Shimadi Bhakti Vedanta Shami, Tinam Nemans Day, Sari Sati Devi, Gunavani Pachari, Nevi Shasas on Yodi Prescata Desa, Sri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda, Sri Advaita Gadadhar Shiva Sati Go Bhaktavinda. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. Brent, thanks for your patience. We're 14 minutes late getting on Facebook Live. Rob was on, right on time on Zoom, but unfortunately the bridge between Zoom and Facebook was difficult to navigate to say the least. I upgraded to Monterey, a new operating system for Mac. And it's been a nightmare ever since then, a couple of days ago. Everything slowing down. It's the simplest click gets the rainbow wheel of death for 10 minutes. <laughs> I don't know what the ultimate solution is going to be. Can't go on like this. And uh, today's session will be a little abbreviated, not only because we're 15 minutes late, but also because I have an interview scheduled with Chaitanya Charan at 9 o'clock Utah time. He's going to be calling me on Zoom from um, Govardhan Eco Village in India, and we're going to talk about tips for giving relevant talks to Western audiences, particularly at the Sunday feast. So I'm looking forward to that, and I'll need to not go over time on this one in order to prepare my notes, interview notes for that one. Yesterday you'll recall in this uh, discussion of the 19th verse in the 8th chapter of the Srimad Bhagavatam, the beautiful story of the Absolute Truth, how Marj Pritu, who was a completely straightforward, over and above board, Shaktavishtar, incarnation of Supreme Personality of Godhead, would not not only would he not praise himself, do you know people who talk about their accomplishments, who sing their own glories, and some or other in doing so diminish their stature in your eyes? With me, it's almost inversely proportional. The more a person brags about themselves, the less I, the less high, or rather they might say, the more my opinion of them drops. We had a gal here not too long ago oh she was just the greatest you know according to her expert executive secretary making a six-figure salary before becoming a devotee and especially driving driving she, said, she talked about how good a driver she was so we were coming back from the festival of colors in las vegas and she wanted to drive the motor home she wanted to drive the motor home i was a i was a 50 or 60 miles behind them in a slower vehicle, the truck. The special truck doesn't take hills well. It would overheat in the hills. And so I told the motorhome to go ahead. And her husband was driving. So they got up ahead 50 or 60 miles at a gas station. They filled up the tank of the motorhome and she had to drive. She had to drive. She was such a good driver. So <laughs> notice I'm not mentioning any names here. She pulled out, she started to pull out from having gotten gas and uh, turned. She turned the wheel right away and just smashed the rear quarter panel of the motorhome up against the, the block, you know, the big concrete block, the island on which the, uh, the uh, gas station dispensers. She didn't get six feet before she'd inflicted $15,000 damage on the motorhome. 
whole bedroom was caved in. You could see sky from the twin bed in the back. Six feet of driving was all that she needed in order to show her expertise. <laughs> Uh, well, I wasn't surprised because of all the self-serving bragging. Usually when people brag, it's to cover up basic insecurities. Those who actually are competent don't need to talk about their competence. They show their competence. And that was Marj Preetu's point also. Krishna hates hypocrisy. Let's get this down in our spirit this morning. When you think about it, many of the kings who Krishna killed, who curbed, were religious by today's standards. I mean, they went to church. They knew the verses. They gave generously. They gave more than 10%, most likely. Um, they weren't atheists. They may have been demigod worshippers, but they believe in higher powers. They had moral standards, and yet Krishna came to destroy them because of their motives. They were doing what they were doing for their own personal fame and name and personal aggrandizement. They weren't doing it out of a selfless sense of service to the Supreme Personality of Godhead. They weren't doing it because of a realization that I am constitutionally Nitya Siddha Krishna Prema. I'm eternally a servant of God, and this is who I am, and service is what I should be doing. No, they would, they would go through the motions of giving in charity, donating, learning slokas, quoting slokas, telling stories, only in order to draw attention to themselves, in effect, that results in detracting attention away from God. Now, God doesn't need attention. He's not a grandstander. He doesn't particularly like to be in the limelight. In fact, just the opposite. He'd prefer to be in the background. But when we glorify him, Mukha means face. When you decorate the mukha, the reflection of that decorated face in the mirror is also beautiful. As, as much as you beautify the face itself with cosmetics and makeup and eyeliner and uh, earrings and nose ring, the more you beautify the face, the more the reflection of the face becomes beautified. So God makes himself available. He's always full of joy. He's always self-satisfied. He's self-sufficient. He needs nothing. He's not added to when we glorify him, nor is he detracted when we fail to do so. He's not pumped up when he hears his name being sung. He's not depressed in arenas where his name is absent. He's completely on the transcendental platform. He's not at any time or in any way affected by the circumstances and the choices that we make here in this material world. But he is motivated by an emotion of pity for us and sadness that we're mucking around this material world, revolving the cycle of birth, death, disease, and old age. And so to help us out, to throw us a lifeline, the Supreme Personality of Godhead descends and accepts our service. He descends, he descends as he did 5,000 years ago in his own original personal form. He also descends as the deity in order to accept our service on an hourly and daily basis. The reason that he descends is he wants to sort out the hypocrites from the simple, straightforward devotees. When he says, I destroy the miscreants, the miscreants are defined as those who pretend that they're one thing when they're actually another thing. Omar's pre -tube was an incarnation of the Lord. He had all good qualities, intelligence, good looks. Later on, during his reign, the thieves and rogues were curbed, curtailed so thoroughly that he didn't actually have to arrest or apprehend or kill any of them. All he had to do was just travel throughout his kingdom on his chariot, twanging his bowstring. Twanging, he would just stretch the bow, even without an arrow, and release it, and the 
thunderous, ominous sound of the bowstring of Mars Pritu twanging was enough to cause the thieves and rogues and criminals to run, to fly here and there in terror and for their wives to have miscarriages. <laughs> That's how powerful he was, how many good qualities he was endowed with. In his kingdom, no one even thought of cheating, lying, or stealing, what to speak of, translated into action. And yet, on his coronation, before he had accomplished any of these amazing feats, the bards and sages were praising him, singing his glories and honoring him. He didn't like that. He told them, tone it down, guys. This is not appropriate. Um, uh, what to speak of those people who allow their followers to glorify them for qualities they don't have. Have we seen any of that recently in American politics? Someone being glorified for qualities that they don't actually have. What to speak of cheaters who allow their followers to praise them for qualities they do not actually have. Maharaj Preetu said in his humility, if even for argument's sake I do have the qualities of which you're singing, I have not shown them yet. Until I show them, you should not praise me. In other words, praise is good. We want to encourage. We want to give other people the bun mo, the good word, the encouragement, the inspiration. We always need to be on the lookout for people that need a little bit of a jump start, a little bit of a, um, a little bit of a lift of encouragement in the form of a good word. But at the same time, you can't flatter people. You can't falsely glorify them. That's not doing anybody any good at all. You have to be t truthful, tactful, and you have to be truthful. You cannot call a blind boy, for instance, Padma Chakshu, Lotus Eye. That's just bald, brazen, inaccurate flattery. So you have to be considerate and be observant enough to note someone's good qualities. Wait until they're manifested. You can't say, well, if you'd been educated, you would have been a good scholar. That's not truthful phrase. You have to note their qualities, wait until they exhibit them, and then comment on them. Wow, that was a great PowerPoint. That was a great, you did a fantastic job on that project I gave you. You not only did what I asked you to, but you did more over and above and beyond. So, Preetu Maharaj was not against praise. In fact, uh, think of all the compliments that Krishna gave Arjuna while bucking him up during uh, Arjuna's crisis before the Kurukshetra War. In the 700 verses of the Bhagavad Gita, there are quite a few times where Krishna called Arjuna the Zion of a great dynasty, called him the great bowman, Sabyasin, called him the winner of the wealth, winner of wealth, the conqueror of champions. All that was accurate. Arjuna had done all that. He'd done tremendous deeds on behalf of the Supreme Personality Godhead on the part of righteousness against wrongdoers. So praising a man factually based on his accomplishments is something we should always look out for and be eager to do. But uh, we shouldn't flatter people in order to get some advantage for our own selves. We shouldn't mislead people for our own advantage. That is manipulative. That is hypocritical. Prabhupada mentions that although Marj Pritu had every right to be glorified and he was endowed with all good qualities, he rejected those praises because they were premature. They were not yet manifest in him. He wanted to stress that one who does not actually possess good qualities should not allow their followers to praise them for qualities they do not have or should not allow their followers to praise them for qualities which just might be manifest in the future. Okay. So this brings us again to the tendency to cheat, one of the four principal defects 
by which people miss worship of the Supreme Personality of it. First is imperfect senses, make mistakes, and tendency to be illusion. And the fourth one, which everybody suffers from, unless you're an incarnation of Godhead or a pure devotee, everybody suffers from the tendency to cheat. In the fourth canto, which is basically the story of King Pritu, we find Indra, the king of the heavenly planets. Now remember, the heavenly planets are not the spiritual world. When Christians talk about heaven and we talk about heaven, we're not talking about the same place. Our heaven is a better place. In this material world, it's populated by demigods who were very pious and righteous in their previous lives as human beings. And then they were elevated to exalted positions of universal management and uh, those managers live on higher planets, heavenly planets. They have a longer span of life extending into the hundreds of thousands of years, a much higher standard of living, but they also have more responsibilities to discharge. Now the king of heaven is called Indra and we find this verse. Tam atrir bhagavan aikshat tromanamam mihasya amukam iva Pakandam yo dharma dharma vi brahmaha. So Indra became envious of Maharaj Pritu. Maharaj Pritu was about to finish his 100th horse sacrifice. And Indra had become Indra, the king of the heavenly planets, in his previous life because of having completed that same number of horse sacrifices. Now he became envious of Pritu. He did not want Pritu to come up to the same number of horse sacrifices. He held the record and he didn't want um, someone to equal the record that he'd set. And on some level, he was afraid that Pritu's motives were to take over, usurp his heavenly um, planet, having, having accumulated the same quantity of pious activities. Of course, nothing was further from Pritu Maharaj's mind, but those who are envious often paint others with their brush because Indra was envious and Indra was competitive and Indra saw others as friends, enemies, and neutral parties. He concluded, he imposed that demented mentality on Pritu. He assumed that because he thought that way, everybody saw it that way. But of course, and that's mostly true, but the exceptions are devotees of the Lord. So Indra went to great lengths to cheat Maharaj Pritu, the results of his hundredth horse sacrifice. He did something which uh, nowadays is not that uncommon, unfortunately, but in those days it was unprecedented. Indra was the first person, as far as we know in history, that in order to take away the horse, now the horse sacrifice comes about in the following way. The, the king who resi resides at the, at the seat of power sends out a horse, and the horse is free to travel anywhere without, within the king's kingdom. And whenever the horse goes through a territory owned by a, a ruler, a feudal, feudal chief or a tribal lord, then the entrance of the horse into their territory is an indication that they need to send some tribute to the king. Generally, the king was in Delhi, in those days known as Hastinapur. And so wherever the horse went, people paid tribute to the king. Now, if the horse was apprehended, if the horse was restrained and caught and prevented from traveling here and there, that was considered a personal affront. That was a challenge to fight for the king. So Indra wanted to have his cake and eat it too. He wanted to capture the horse, which would interrupt the horse sacrifice. The, only, the horse sacrifice could only be performed after the horse had gone through all lands and all lands had demonstrated they weren't going to contest the reign of the king by sending tribute. But if someone grabbed the horse, it meant that there had to be a fight. But Indra wanted his cake and eat it too. He grabbed the horse, trying to cheat Maharaj Priku of, the, of his ability to do one, a 100th horse sacrifice. But when Priku started to wade into the fight, because that was, that, was, that was a fight. When you took the horse, you were you would fight. So Pritu came to fight, but Indra was too cowardly to fight with Pritu Maharaj. As I mentioned before, all he had to do was twang his bow and it would strike people with terror. That's how powerful he was. So Indra changed into the dress of a Swami. 
he took on the saffron okra colored robes of someone in the renounced order of life, a celibate single Brahmin or a Swami. And doing so was a form of egregious cheating in those days, for it falsely created an impression that this was a religious person. Here is hypocrisy personified. In order to fulfill his own materialistic ambitions for his own convenience and to pursue his own design, Indra be, uh, uh, became an imposter, the king of Indra, rides on an elephant, lives in a palace who has the Nanda, Nanda gardens and Apsars at his disposal, goes to the point of hypocrisy by presenting himself as a saffron robed renunciate. So he was the first one to qualify for the derogatory Sanskrit term pakanda. Pakanda sometimes pronounced pasanda. Pasanda. Yashtu narayanam devam brahmarudiri samadvenarvik sa pasandi bavedrava. Says one who ignores the worship of Narayan. One may go to church, one may be a renunciate, one may be knowledgeable in the scriptures. One may wear the saffron robes, but Yashtu Narayanam Devam, one who worships other gods other than Narayan, the Supreme Personality of Godhead, is really no better than a Pashanda. That means a hypocritical person who poses themselves as someone religious in order to cheat others. And uh, although Indra was the first one to do it thousands and thousands of years ago, he wasn't the last one to do it. Many Many imposters have adopted the saffron dress and presented themselves as liberated persons or even as incarnations of God in order to cheat people. This was predicted, again, in the fourth canto where the sacrifice of Daksha is described. It says, Sarva Baksha Dvija Vira Dvija Vira Vita Dehandriyana Yachaka Vikarantiraham the followers of Lord Shiva cursed the Brahmin followers of Daksha that in the future those Brahmins would take to education, austerity, and vows only. Vita prana. Prana means just to maintain. Uh, vita dehendriya. Deha means body and vita means maintenance. Only for the maintenance of the body, not for honoring God taking up the process of devotional service, setting an example of renounced, renounced devotional behavior for the well-being of people in general. No, they will hypocritically adopt the Brahminical uh, title, the Brahminical dress, only in order to fill their bellies. They will learn scriptures in order to fill their bellies. They will do pujas in order to fill their bellies. They will go about begging from door to door simply for the satisfaction of the body. My Bobby and I were in Kerala. One time we're taking an early warning japa wap on the beach. And I saw in one corner of the beach there, on, uh, we were in uh, Barkala, there were five or six Brahmins doing uh, a hoven, doing a fire sacrifice. They had some bricks. They had a little hoven kun fire pit there. And they were doing the fire sacrifice, and I recognized some of the mantras. Om Sahasrasirisha Purusha Sahasaksha Sahasapap Sambhavam Vishadu Chadista Dishangana Purusheva Gadam Sarvam Yaksbudam Yaksaba Tamrita Dishesana Yadana Taroti Hedavanasha Mahima To Jagam Sha Purusha Parusha Vishabhutane Tri Parasham Viri Viri Tajma Virida Jayata Vira Jodi Purusha Sajatu Itarichata Pashid Bumimato Karasha They were doing this fire sacrifice, chanting all the uh, authentic Vedic mantras. I was so excited, I went over and I sat down and bathed myself in the sound orations. There were some tourists there, businessmen and their family who had paid the Brahmins some money in order to do the fire sacrifice, presumably for some material blessing, which is also a form of hypocrisy, to try to make the Lord your servant. We are constitutionally servants of God. We should ask not what God can do for me, but what I can do for him. 
In any case, the priests finished the sacrifice. They collected the rupees. And as the family was moving off down the beach, they all lit up cigarettes. And I'm like, what? <laughs> what? So you just had a good sacrifice. <laughs> you made some money. And now you want to spend some of that money in a self-satisfied, complacent way by lighting up a cigarette, huh? This post, what is it? Post-sacrificial ritual. Do the sacrifice. Pray to God. Use God as a as your servant. Inflate your position. Deflate God's position. And then stimulate your senses at the end by having a cigarette. And so these personalities would like us to believe they were liberated by their dress, by their titles. They would like us to believe they are liberated, but in fact, they're addicted to nicotine. They would like us to believe that they are renounced from all worldly affairs, but they're prostitutes for the almighty rupee. They would like us to believe that they're engaged in the service of the Supreme Personality of Godhead, but in fact, their service is only for their tongue, their belly, and their genitals. Krishna warns in the sixth chapter of the Bhagavad Gita, Nasita karma phalam kayam karma karotiya cha sanyasi chajro na niragbhira chakra. Supreme Personality of God, Krishna said to Arjuna, one who is unattached to the fruits of his work and who works as he is obligated for the satisfaction of the Supreme Personality of Godhead is in the renounced order of life. He is the true mystic and not he who thinks of himself as beyond the rules and regulations and the discipline of the priestly devoted class of men. Prabhupada explains that the sannyasis and the swamis sometimes, especially those of the Mayavadi persuasion, those who talk about oneness all the time, becoming one, merging into the Supreme Personality of Godhead, they often think that they have become liberated from all material duties, that they are situated in transcendence just by virtue of having adopted the saffron dress and, uh, and, uh, and they're on the path towards non-discriminate um, non-discriminate merging into the effulgence of the Supreme. And for those who want to dis distance themselves from material desires, profit and gain, adulation. That's a, that's a that's a worthy ambition, you know, one who finds the 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 business of the ordinary person distasteful and wants to rise above that, get to some sort of a higher spiritual level. That's a very worthy ambition. Certainly such a person is better than the common mass of people. But the pitfall of wanting to transcend matter is that one can be mistakenly guided towards wanting to become one with God. Um, and that, and in, in that monistic pursuit, in that monistic school of thought, one misses the fact that although God is one, he also is variegated. He is both one individual living being, but his creative nature is such that he creates in millions and millions and millions of variety, million, millions and millions of diversity. And so one can use the things of this world, whereas the monist rejects the variety of this material world. He doesn't acknowledge any reality to the material phenomena. He says, Brahma Satya Jagat Mitya, only spirit is truth and this material world is false. So whereas the monist rejects out of hand everything material and puts on a big show of being detached from it and then when no one's looking lights up a cigarette which is the which is the definition of hypocrisy a devotee recognizes that while these material phenomena are temporary material and created of an inferior energy to the spiritual energy they are nevertheless put here for the purpose of serving the lord and so a krishna conscious person uses everything, works in any way which will bring about the satisfaction of the Lord without any personal self-interest. 
A Krishna conscious person has no desire for so-called self-satisfaction, separate or independent from Krishna. We all desire self-satisfaction, but the difference between devotional service and service outside of devotional service is that devotee wants his self-satisfaction through Krishna. And that makes all the difference in the world. Non-devotee and devotee may be acting in artificially or superficially similar ways, but the devotee is not a hypocrite. The devotee is not dual-minded. I'll do this in order to get this. The devotee serves the Lord in order to get more service to the Lord, thinking of oneself as an eternal servitor of the Lord. Kama, prema, donakara, vibhana, loa, arhema, yaiche, surupa, vilakshara. Devotional service and material service, self-service, may both be similar in some ways, just as gold and iron are both metals. However, there's a difference in value between gold and iron. The iron is basically valueless, whereas the gold is of practically incalculable value. So a person acting in Krishna conscious works for the satisfaction of the whole. Say the finger. The finger can either try to directly enjoy itself or it can enjoy through the stomach. When the finger tries to enjoy directly, it fails miserably. The finger has no capacity. If there's a cup of sweet rice, the finger can plunge itself into that sweet rice. But not only will the finger not be satisfied, but the sweet rice will be spoiled. So the finger wants to enjoy. We are like the finger in as much as we want to enjoy. But the key is to enjoy through Krishna, not to enjoy part, apart from Krishna. So in that sense, a Krishna conscious person has no desire for direct independent self-satisfaction, but gets self-satisfaction through watering the root of the tree, through putting food into the stomach. This is the criterion of success. Is Krishna pleased by the food that I eat? Is Krishna pleased by the movies that I watch? Is Krishna pleased and honored by the books that I read? Is Krishna pleased by the people with whom I surround myself, the people in whose association I spend the most time? Is Krishna pleased? Krishna, Krishna, Krishna. Savai pum sam paro dharmo yato bhakti ahai tukiya patiya ta yadma shupashiti. Without any desire for personal satisfaction, without any ulterior motive, nor without any interruption, the highest perfectional occupation of the living being is to engage in devotional service of the Lord. That and that only will completely satisfy this soul. And Krishna loves us too much to leave us on any other level than that ultimate level of devotional service. And he has no tolerance for leaders, unlike Maharaj Prikhu, like King Indra, who allow their followers to praise him for qualities they don't have or to praise him for qualities they may have but they have not yet manifested. The Lord wants forthrightness. He wants straightforwardness. He wants transparency. He wants honesty. He does not need perfection, but he needs, he needs transparency. What you see is what you get. And so you find without any exception, devotees of the Lord are very, very simple, honest, forthright people. Uh, certainly like an oasis in a desert. <laughs> certainly refreshing considering the jadedness and the uh, ubiquitous hypocrisy which is the very characteristic of this age so all glories to the devotees of the lord Hare krishna Hare krishna 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 Hare 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 ram Hare ram 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 Hare Hare. well it's amazing that we had uh, so many of you are patient <laughs> We were 14 minutes late getting on and we're leaving. We're only having a half an hour session because I'm interviewing Chaitanya Charan at nine o'clock about how to give a relevant lecture to a Western audience. And I'm really excited about that. Um, but uh, yeah, a, a, very, a lot of uh, technological twists and turns this morning. I upgraded on my Mac to Monterey, the latest operating system, and it's just been one challenge after another. But anyway... We're here. 
let's uh, hear from Rob, and please send me those. What uh, what little catchy phrases you might have turned out of this morning's session? Are there any? Okay, he might have just nipped out for a glass of water or something. Rob, if you're there, let us know what... Uh, Hey, Krishna Prabhuji. Oh, I've got a, an upset three-year-old, <laughs> but I do I do have some notes that I can give you real quick. <laughs> Please do. Um, deride pride. That was a quickie. Yeah. Yeah. Um, don't stumble, stay humble. Nice. And don't satisfy the finger. <laughs> People might not know what that means. <laughs> <laughs> I guess that's true. I didn't think about how that might come out. <laughs> well, thank you for those as always. Nice Hare little Krishna. information for our talk. And thanks, Britta, for jumping on board. I've been following your Facebook posts. Um, who was it yesterday about some someone that you resonated with, you and Adrian resonated with when you were younger? Who was that? Did they pass away? Was that the occasion of your post? Anyway, if you're hearing me, go ahead and fill us in on the details there in the comment section. Thank you, Sundari Priya. Hare Krishna, all glories to Prabhupada. Anjali says, we are prone to make mistakes. We have imperfect senses, illusory, and tendency to cheat. And we talked primarily about the tendency to cheat. No one is immune, even Indra. The king of heaven has a tendency to cheat. He even started the irresponsible practice of posing oneself as more exalted than one actually is. But what about the phrase, flatter will get you everywhere? Most people flatter other people because they want something for themselves. They have their own agenda in mind. And people accept flattery for the same reason. So it's all hypocrisy. There's no value in it. There's no truth in it. <clears throat> Bye, Bobby. Thanks for joining. Jay, good morning. Manasaganga is doing an art project about her namesake. Well, the original Ganga. She's named after a ghat to which the Ganges River was called. But she's doing an art project on the original Ganges as it flowed down from the causal ocean and entered this universe many, many years ago. Brent was the first one to jump on board this morning, even though we were 14 minutes late. Jean, thank you all very much. I'm going to prepare now for an interview with Chaitanya Charon. And... Uh, Beyond that, for tomorrow's segment, Wisdom Wednesday. And hopefully, we'll be able to launch on time at 7.30. But it's certainly gratifying to know that even on those days when we have difficulties and delays, you're patient enough to wait for Chibru, who is a technological um, rebate to solve things and get it up to speed. Thank you all. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, 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 Hare Hare, Hare Ram, Hare Ram, Ram Ram, Hare Hare. Reprobate, I think is the word, not rebate.